tonight very quickly. I just want to share with us briefly tonight on the ministry of the sent man. Because most of you are going to be commissioned tonight. I'll, I'll be delivering one of the shortest sermons from this altar this evening. Glory to Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. I'll be delivering one of the shortest sermons I've delivered from this platform tonight. And I trust that the Lord will set up and charge up someone for the great work of the ministry. Glory to Jesus. I just want to highlight four basic things about the sent man. The first is the mentality of a sent man. The second are the credentials of a sent man. The third is the emphasis or the message of a sent man. And the fourth is the validation of the sent man. Glory to Jesus. Please don't be distracted. We are still trying to manage the light situation. I hope it's not out of place to drop this one. It is a body. We are finished with lectures. Let's enter the word of God. By the way, can we celebrate my friend, Apostle Salvation Sule, all the way from Adama State, is here with us tonight. Glory to Jesus. Thank you. So, open your Bibles with me very quickly to Matthew chapter 28 verse 16. And then we also have John chapter 20 verse 21. And then we have Mark chapter 16 verse 15. The mentality of a sent man. Every one of us on the face of the earth is on an errand. I've taught you before that there is only one who is self-sufficient and who exists for himself. His name is the I am that I am. Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. When God introduced himself to Moses, he said, Tell them, I am that I am have sent you. The I am have sent you. So God is the only one who is not running errand for anybody. But every other person on the face of the earth is on an errand. We are all sent of God. And you see, whether you make progress, whether your life commands impact or not, is a product or a function of the mentality you sustain. If you don't see yourself as one sent of God, you may end up whiling away time until your time on earth is over and you return to the master. The moment Jesus returned from the grave, the major emphasis that Jesus projected before the disciples was the fact that from now on, they become a people sent on an errand. And so anybody who has come to understand and embrace the resurrection of Jesus must automatically come into the consciousness of one sent. Matthew 28 from verse 18. The moment he showed up, he began to talk to them immediately and he said, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And he said, You go therefore in that power and disciple all nations, teaching them all that you have received from me, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And he said, Lo, I am with you always unto the end of the age. The moment he resurrected, they were excited. You would think, oh, this is time to celebrate his victory over the grave. There was no such time. I didn't come back from the grave for us to have a party. I came back from the grave to transfer the mission I was running to you. So, the first response to the resurrection of Jesus actually is accepting the mandate to be sent. Anybody who has not accepted the mandate to be sent has not really embraced the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Go into all the world. In John chapter 20 verse 21, same context, as the Father has sent me, it says, so also send I you as the Father has sent me. So, 
When you see the life of Jesus, one thing you see and discover is that Jesus operated with a consciousness of one cent. From the age of 12, his parents came to find him in the temple after not seeing him for three days. And a boy of 12 years gave the most surprising response of all time. Where have you been? Don't it occur to you that we will be troubled looking for you? And he said, why are you looking for me? Are you not aware that you should, I should be about my father's business? That was the mentality of Jesus at the age of 12. And Jesus was about that errand three days without eating or drinking. Questioning the doctors of the law and answering the questions because they couldn't answer the questions. At the age of 12, he was already saturated with the passion of running the errands of God. Is it not a shame? That some of us have been Christians for 10 years, for 15 years, yet there is no mandate we are running with. What Jesus at the age of 12 was already saturated with, the passion was already consuming him. How can a boy of 12 not eat for 3 days and 3 nights? No record. He remained with the doctors of the law and he was engaging them on matters of the kingdom. Because the purpose of existence amongst other things is to run the errands of God. If you are on this side of the divide and you don't have a relationship with God, you don't know God and you are not running any errand for God, your existence is already a waste. This is why we must all build that mentality because this is what God is about. He has an agenda he wants to fulfill on this side of the earth and we are his foot soldiers in fulfilling that agenda. In Mark chapter 16 verse 15, Jesus was speaking to the disciple. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. All the world. In fact, when I was doing these studies, I discovered that Jesus was deliberate in the way he structured this operation. Because it's something you will do for the rest of your life. If you study Matthew 28 verse 19, the first word used there is all nations. And the word nations is the word ethnos. It means basic sphere of influence. Like family, like friends. That's where you begin from. If you go to Matthew 24 verse 14. Where Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the worlds. The word word used there is the word oikomin. And it means systems and empires. So what Jesus was introducing us to is something that we completely eat up our life. It will begin with your family and friends when you are done with them. He said, go to institutions. If you are a lecturer, go there as a sent man. If you are a military officer, go there as a sent man. If you are a businessman, go there as a sent man. If you are called into the fivefold ministry, do it with all your heart as a sent man. Because it's not enough that you have conquered your friends. It's not enough that you have conquered your family. You have to conquer your organization. And Jesus didn't stop there. In Matthew 16, 15, he said, go into all the worlds. The word, word used there is the word cosmos. That is the whole act. So you begin from family to established institutions to the whole act. So Jesus wants us to build the mentality of a people sent. And sent until we get to impact the whole world. This is what powered all of the prophets. This is what powered all of the apostles. This is what powered Jesus Christ. And this is what must power us. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, they told the prophet, Before you were formed in your mother's womb, you, I didn't bring you here for you to enjoy. I brought you here because there is an agenda. He said, Before you came forth, I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. And he began to tell him his job description. So if you didn't have, if God didn't have an agenda, there wouldn't have been a need for you to be born. That means what validates your existence is the degree to which you are about that agenda. So every prophet of old was running with a mentality that they are sent of God. And that is why the last of the Old Testament prophet, which was John, when he was introduced in John chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible said there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. There was a man sent from God. Every one of the prophets knew they were sent to their generation. 
Some of us have the mentality that we are here to survive. And that's why we go only to places where we can fare fare well in life. We go to only places where we have advantage. We don't go to places that border on the errand that we are running. Because it has not dominated us. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That was the mentality. And all of the apostles of Jesus, this was the mentality they sustained. Because Jesus himself told them, go into all the world. And then the disciples they raised, that was the same mentality. Acts chapter 8 verse 5, it said Philip went down to Samaria. The first thing he did was to preach Christ there. And the Bible said the whole city was full of joy. Every one of them had the mentality of sent people to their generation. Every time you read Romans chapter 1 from verse 1, it says Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. A Paul, a man sent of Jesus Christ to a generation. That is the mentality that every Christian must have. Listen, you are sent to your generation. You may start from your family. You may start from your organization. You may not have built capacity enough to address your generation. But you must register it at the depth of your heart that you are sent to your generation. If that mentality is not formed, you stand the risk of living a life that has no impact in eternity. We are sent. We are here on an errand. We are here on a purpose. Everything we have is given to us in order to facilitate that agenda. Every opportunity we have is given to us in order to facilitate that agenda. We are not here just to enjoy life. Enjoyment is the least thing about life. Fulfilling purpose is the major cost for existence. You are sent. You are sent. It's unfortunate that many have lived for so long, yet they've not been able to build the mentality of a sent man. And so the first thing we need to know and have is that we are sent. And then if you know that you are sent, there are certain credentials that must be built into your life. You must become deliberate to allow yourself and allow the Holy Ghost build these credentials into your life. Because the reason many people live carelessly is because they are not aware that they are on an errand. When a man is on an errand, there are certain things that define how he lives his life. Those are the credentials of a sent man. And the first of those credentials is sustained passion. If you are sent, you don't live like everybody. There is an energy level from which you live your life. Find out somebody who is going on a mission. He doesn't have the liberty that everybody has. Jesus was speaking in John 2, 17. He said, the zeal of my father's house have consumed me. He knew there was a passion with which he was running. And one thing the devil looks out for is how to diffuse your passion. Because he knows that the fuel for your life is the passion with which you run with. If he's able to tamper with your passion, your journey will stop. And this is the problem with many people. I was teaching somewhere in Uyo this morning. I was in Akwaibon this morning. And I was preaching in the service. And I told them, there are two things about passion. Number one is focus. Number two is resilience. If you want to keep your passion strong, nothing must happen to your focus. So what keeps a man passionate is his ability to keep his eyes single. The moment your eyes become divergent, your, your focus has been affected, your passion will go down. Because the secret of passion is focus. In 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 40, the king, the prophet told the king a parable. He said, my Lord gave me a servant to keep. He said, but as I was busy here and there, I lost him. Jesus was speaking, he said, if your eyes be single, he said, your whole body will be filled with light. The reason many have lost their passion is because they have no focus. In one month, they attend 12 birthday parties. In one month, they attend 15 naming ceremonies. Augusta, you are not a party. They go to places where they have no business. They go to places where they are not celebrated. They just come and hang around. And you hear them, waiting they happen here. If you don't know waiting they happen, why you come? They don't even have enough dignity to be invited. They show up and they are shaking everybody, trying to stand around important people and appear in pictures. Why not go and service your passion? 
when your time comes, anywhere you stand, that's where things will happen. But it's a mentality. I was listening to Bishop David Oedeko. He said he was in Lagos for 21 years. He didn't know the road to the market. He said he only knows the road to two places. To the church and to the airport. Because it's about his business. The things that are not important, he looks for people who, who, who can do that. Who, their, level, their purpose for life is at that level. He pays them to do it. So that they can maximize time. Because your greatest asset is actually time. And if you are not passionate, you will waste time. They asked Chino Achebe, if you were given the opportunity again, what will you demand for? He said he would demand for his lifetime. Because if he, knows what, if he knew what he knows at that age, he would have achieved much more. And you see people wasting their energy going nowhere. Because there is no focus, passion cannot be serviced. Somebody wakes up in the morning, the first thing he greets is his phone. And he's there looking at pictures till 12. His headache that will stop him from that phone. And he stands up, he eats food, he comes back. By the time he's looking at the time again, it's 4 p.m. The day is finished. And his heart is not troubled. He has not learned anything. He has not serviced his pastor. And he's hoping that God will exalt him. He's hoping that he will become significant in his generation. It is not possible. Even if we pour a drum of oil on your head, you will go nowhere. Learn to service your pastor. See, find out where you are going to. Build your whole life around it. And you will see how impactful your life will begin become. That's why focus is important. Focus is the way to service passion. And then resilience is the capacity to bounce back anytime you fall. If you don't have enough energy in your spirit, when you fall, you will remain down. The Bible said if you faint in the day of trouble, it's not because Satan is strong. It's not because your God does not care. He said it's because your strength is little. So the reason we build passion is against the day of adversity. In case I fall, there should be residual energy to bounce back. The Bible said if a righteous man falls seven times, they say seven times he will rise again. That means there should be energy reserved in your spirit for you to be able to bounce back. But many are not building energy because they don't know that it's a necessary ingredient for a man who is on a mission. Did you read the story of the foolish virgins? At the crucial time, that was when they ran out of oil. And they came to their fellows. They thought it was a cheap thing to access. Give us oil. They said, no. Oil is not given. It's bought. And they said, go to them that have and buy. Unfortunately, there was no time. And that's the problem many people have. They discover on their deathbed the things they should have done in 70 years. And in five seconds, their whole lifetime runs through them. And they realize they wasted all their time doing nothing. Please, don't be found anywhere that does not have an impact on your destiny. You should be able to discipline yourself. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I beat my body. I bring it under subjection. Especially those of you who are graduating today. See what this training has done to you. In six weeks, one person wins 200 souls. Now, divide your age into six weeks and see how many six weeks you have lived for. Some of you have lived for over 100 six weeks. But the impact you have had in the last six weeks is more than all of the 99 six weeks that you have lived. Because you were not mature in your understanding to become deliberate about your timing. One thing you must do if you are spent is to know how to sustain your passion. Number two credential of a man sent is the ability to keep your vision alive. You can't go anywhere if you are not seeing anything. Everybody God sent, he showed them something. He told Abraham, lift up your eyes and see. He said, as far as your eyes can see, I've given to you. Anybody you see who is desperate, who is aggressive, he is seeing something. Because that thing he is seeing is his destination. And so anything that does not look like it cannot get his time or his attention. So you must learn, when God gives you a vision, learn to keep it clear. Learn to keep it fresh. I know I'm a preacher. So one thing I do is to watch preachers that have gone ahead of me. When I see the impact their lives command, 
I know I've not started. So my results today cannot distract me. Because when I see what they are doing, I know I'm just starting. Sometimes I go as far back as watching people who are doing what I'm doing in 1940, 1950. And I see the level of power and impact they commanded. And I told myself, I came 80 years after them. And this is what I'm doing. It's child's play. Sometimes when I read my Bible and I see the impact that people who call themselves apostles wrought, I tell myself, if, they, if God says all the apostles will stand, I doubt it I will stand there. Imagine people like Paul. They were able to enter the heart of God and extract the heart of the Father and they became scripture. We are still preaching and making mistakes. We like come to preach and throw in casually. If there were apostles before me who what they wrote was scripture, do I have the right to preach a message and be wrong? The Bible said these guys did terrible miracles. Terrible miracles. Some of them, their shadows were healing the sick. Shadow. Shadow. Some of them, their handkerchiefs were healing the sick. We are still here pulling people out of which they are falling back. Pulling people. Do we have the luxury to relax? So the way I keep my visions fresh is by looking at those who have run that path. He said, follow them. Hebrews 6.12 Who through faith and patience have obtained the promise. You say you are a politician. You say you are a leader. You say you are a scientist. How many scientists do you know? You can't impact that world. And then how many Christian scientists do you know who broke through in knowledge and who still impacted their world by the power of the kingdom? You don't know any of them. How can you excel? You say God is sending you to the political corridor. How many Christian politicians do you know across the ages who were able to use the power of righteousness and their giftings to ascend the ladder of politics and governance and also to remain righteous on those corridors? That's why most times move, our vision is diffused. Somebody said he's on fire for God. After two years, you see him later. He say, oh my, no easy. You know why? He didn't know how to manage his vision. He didn't know how to keep his vision alive. He didn't know how to keep his sight fresh. He allowed himself to be polluted. If you are a saint man, you must have the ability to keep your visions alive. Number three, every saint man has values. We are regulated by value systems. Because as you enter into the world, you will make many friends. Both the good, the bad, and the ugly. As you grow in discernment, you will eventually select the good and avoid the evil and the ugly. But before you grow to that level, where your discernment becomes as sharp as knowing, one thing that will guide you is your value system. Trust me, if you lose your value system, you become like those you are sent to. There will be no difference between the sent man and the people he is sent to. So one of the things that distinguishes us is the ability to sustain our value system. Read your Bible. Is replete everywhere. Matthew chapter 5 verse 5. It said the meek shall inherit the earth. That means everyone who is sent to take over the earth must sustain meekness. The Bible said in Matthew 5, 13 and 14, you are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill that cannot be hid. You are the salt of the earth. He said if a salt loses its savour, he said what is it good for? It is thrown and trampled under feet. So everyone who is sent must have value system that distinguishes him. What does it mean to be the salt of the earth? What does it mean to be the light of the world? It means you are the standard of morality. People look at you and you are the reference. You cannot be part of the fornicators. You cannot be part of the liars. You cannot be part of those who are involved in bribe. They show up that something has gone wrong. And you see the people who are arrested. Nathaniel, Victor. Some even bear Jesus. And you find Jesus accused of rape. And then you are wondering, do you know where that name came from? They arrest bandits. What is the name? The name is Christian. And then you are wondering, do you know the meaning of Christian? Because they were not taught that even the names given to them is prophetic. Because they are sent men. So anywhere you stand, if they say Christian, if they are looking for truth, they should ask Christian. If they are looking for morality, they should ask Christian. This is who we are. We must sustain value system. Hear me. If you lose your value system, you are not going anywhere. Don't deceive yourself. You can be part of a move. You can even be part of those who sit in front, like my brothers here. You can be part of those who take announcements, who give sermons. 
If you don't have value system, you are deceiving yourself, not the people. Because time will reveal who is right. That's why the preacher must become one with his preaching. The messenger must become one with his message. If your value contradicts what you teach, you have lost your journey. I'm telling you, this is basic aspect of Christianity, but these are the things lacking. People know all the right messages to preach. A man will preach on forgiveness, you will literally weep. But he's keeping malice with 30 people. A man will preach on holiness and the fire of hell. You will think, oh, this generation has hope. The next time you go close to him, thinking you will be inspired, he's making calls in the hiding. And then you find out later, you enter his office with this, the consciousness that you are around the holy man. Lo and behold, he's hugging somebody and he's in a compromised position. When he looks at you, he says, Brother, you know, uh, we are being helped of God. This is why, at the end of the day, most of us create impression, not impact. Somebody told me he was listening to an apostle. An apostle that he taught is an answer to this generation. A mighty apostle. And as he was listening, he dozed off. And as he dozed off, the next thing, he went straight into immorality. Why he was yet hearing the voice of the apostle. He woke up, what is going on? From that day, he started struggling with lust. From that day. You know what that means? The person is different from his preaching. He knows what to say for people to accept him. But his character is a contradiction of the message. And so no matter how big you appear, that is impression. It cannot survive the test of eternity. And so every one of us here who is hoping to represent God and to run the errand of God, one thing you must choke yourself with are value systems, patience, kindness, meekness, love, integrity, transparency, truthfulness, humility, brokenness. See, if you want every month, pick one, study it and pattern your life after it. Because your lifestyle is more important than your message. It is your value systems that validate your message. The power of your message is rooted in your lifestyle. If your lifestyle contradicts your message, you are not preaching anything, you are just talking. And so everyone who is sent must build value systems. If I ask you now, what are your values? What will you say? I know you've caught some fire. I know you were passionate about soul winning. I know you have done well academically. We can cram scriptures and pass exams. But the question is, if your life is passed through the vent, will your life pass? And what God is interested in first is your lifestyle. Because if your life is wrong, you have no message for your generation. The third credential of a sent man is value systems. The fourth credential of a sent man is structure and organization. Listen, there is not much God can commit to you if your life is random and haphazard. There are many people who are gifted, but their problem is that they are spontaneous. There is no structure around anything. When you study the life of Jesus, you will be amazed the level of structure that Jesus operated with. Every time men came to see Jesus, there are 12 apostles. Only one will be mentioned, Philip. Acts chapter, John chapter 6, John chapter 12. When they needed bread, the Bible said, Philip came to him and said, we have a young boy here that has five loaves and two fish. When the Greek came to seek him, in John chapter 12, the Bible said, Philip telleth Nathanael, and Nathanael telleth Jesus that the Greek were here to see him. That means there is a protocol in Jesus' ministry. It's not every apostle that runs to Jesus and says, this person wants to see you. This, everybody had what they were doing. You study your Bible, you hear that Judas Iscariot was the one carrying the purse. So there was somebody in charge of finance. Every time Jesus went to pray, Matthew 8, from verse 5 to verse 18, you see it replete. Jesus went with Peter, James, and John. So there were people who were in charge of prayer and ecclesiastical operation. Things are not done randomly. Everywhere things are done randomly, they are not going anywhere. You must be deliberate in establishing structure. And the apostles applied the same. You read your Bible, Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Ghost came and people were talking. It's not everybody that started responding. 
Nobody explained. They were quiet. People were talking and talking until the Bible said, and Peter and the eleven stood up. And Peter began to speak. This is what the prophet Joel spoke about. Acts 2 from verse 16. It's not everybody talking. You come to certain environment as things are not working well. This one stands up. This one. And before you know, there are 20 different messages going into the world. People who are on a mission don't operate like that. Even in the secular world, they know better. If you go to the army, there is somebody who is in charge of public relations. You will never hear any soldier tell you anything about anything except the official message that goes out. But we have people who are trained from church today. Any little thing, 30 people have given 30 different reports. Who sent you? There's no structure. There's no order. That's why we can't take our word. A sent man brings himself under administration. Paul was speaking to Timothy. He said that you know how things will be done in the house of God, which is the ground and the pillar of truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 There is a way things are done in the house of God. In the apostolic community, only the apostles spoke. Now, there was a time in Acts chapter 6 where the multitude of the people were scalated because they started growing and making impact. And they didn't know what to do anymore. Everybody was complaining. They are not giving food to our widows. The apostle said, Select from among you seven men. This is not everybody that handles everything. Seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And we will put them in charge of these things. And they selected seven men who were in charge of matters of tables. It's called order. It's called administration. It's called structure. Every sent man must have order. And you don't need to become a massive organization before you have order. You can be going out to win souls with three people. You designate one person to coordinate apostolic mapping. Where and where you need to go to. They do a survey. You coordinate another person who is in charge of media publicity. And then one person is preaching. That's how you make impact. And if you make impact like that, you can collate the impact. You can give account of that impact and you can move progressively from one level to another. And the same applies to your business. Listen, don't do business haphazardly. You can't go anywhere. There should be a threshold that expenditure cannot go past. There should be a threshold of savings. There should be a threshold of investment. See, this is how business is done. Because you can't make progress if all that comes in is all that goes out and there is nothing regulating it. Sent people have structures. They have administration. They are orderly and organized people. It's a credential for a man who is sent. And then finally, because of our time, I'll stop here. The fifth credential of a sent man is power. If you don't have authority, you'll be a victim. I've told you several times, Luke 24, 49, Jesus said to them, wait until you are endued with power from on high. Don't go telling people, I was the one who went with him to Canaan at the wedding. I was the one who was coordinating those who were fetching water. You will be cut off. Don't go telling people, I came with him to Galilee the other time. I saw you. See, this is a generation where people want to use politics to become relevant. If you are dealing only with men, politics would have worked. But we are dealing with demons. We are dealing with principalities and powers. You need personal empowerment. If you don't have it, you can't be sent. Mark 3.14 He called them to be with him that he might send them. Why are they with him? Number one, to learn character. And number two, to receive empowerment. And he said, tarry until you are endued with power. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 Not many days from now, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. You shall receive power. Listen, all of you graduating tonight, don't leave this auditorium until you have received power. Because you will need power to make a difference. It takes a lot of authority to make a difference. Because without power, you can advance the vision. Without power, you cannot counter opposing forces. This is why you need power. And power in this kingdom is not a very difficult thing. Why is it so? Because you are not the author of the power. Your job is to understand how to use the power that has been made available. And when you read the life of the apostles, you will discover that they had few keys 
and few channels from whence they drew power. And I want to zero in on one very quickly. The apostles had channels from whence they drew power. And those channels never fail. You look at them, they kept operating that channel. The first channel the apostles used to access power is the channel of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 from verse 1. The moment they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they went and manifested power. And so for them, power is an overflow of the Holy Ghost. So whatever you need to do until the Holy Ghost overflows from you, you must do it. And one of the things they discovered triggered the overflow of the Holy Ghost was prayer. That is why in Acts chapter 4, when they were beaten, the Bible said they returned to their own company. And they lifted their voices and they prayed. From verse 28, they told God, Behold their threatenings. It's a grant that your, your servants might receive the spirit of boldness to preach the word. And it said, By stretching forth thy hand, that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child. And the Bible said, The place where they were was shaken. And they were filled again with the Holy Spirit. In verse 33, the Bible said, and with great power, God gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus, and great grace was upon them. So they knew power is not a difficult thing. What must you do to be overflown by the Holy Spirit? And I've taught you here, there are many things to do for the overflow of the Holy Ghost to come. Number one is prayer. It's a building up yourself upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. When you build up yourself, it means you are charging up yourself. And so if you want to walk in power, make sure you remain charged. I told you, worship can stir up the power of God. In 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 15, the Bible said, Elisha said, get me a minstrel. And he said, as the minstrel began to play, the man began to prophesy. Because when genuine worship goes forth, the Holy Ghost moves. Number three, I told you, channel for power is revelation. Every time you do business with the word of God, you stir the Holy Ghost. You stir the Holy Ghost. Because Ezekiel 2 verse 1, he said, as he spake unto me, the spirit entered me. So the word of God is not primarily for educating you. It is for filling you with the spirit. He said, be not drunk with wine, wearing his excess. He said, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to yourselves. That's meditation. Hagar. Talking the word to yourself in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual song, making melody to the Lord. Making melody as you talk the word of God to yourself, as you listen to the word of God, the Holy Ghost overflows your soul and it flows out of you. That overflow is power. Listen, please. Don't run from this meeting today and say, Oh, I've done foundation school. The apostle prayed for me. Keep yourself charged. You will need power in order to operate successfully as a sent man. And one of the ways to operate in power is to remain filled with the Holy Ghost. This is why Paul was teaching in 2 Corinthians 3.14. He said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. The key there is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The love of God is why God sent Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is everything Jesus did in order for you to be accepted in the beloved. But the communion of the Spirit is what will bring validation to the first two operations. So a man who doesn't know how to engage the Holy Ghost to be overflooded with power cannot operate as a saint man. If you go with zeal and challenge your boss, you will suffer for four years. You hear a story that, ah, there was a Christian who went to the bank. And his boss spoke and he stood up and said, No, I'm a child of God. And I said this, say that. If you are not charged, you will regret why you said that for the rest of your life. The first thing they will hide your file for four years. And all the recommendations that will go to headquarters will be negative. And if you are not careful, you lose your job. And the frustration may make you begin to curse God. Because what you are doing is not rooted in life. What you are doing is copy and paste. And copy and paste is dangerous if there's no foundation. They told you that, oh, somebody saw terrorists and they were shooting people. And he stood up and came out and challenged them. And they shot him and he didn't enter. Oh God, don't try it. 
The person who stood and they shot and he didn't enter was moved by the Holy Ghost. It's a holy man of God spake as they were moved. If you are not moved and you carry a story in your head and you go and stand, they will shoot you. We will come there and pick your corpse. And you know what the Bible said? Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of a saint. You will go to heaven gallantly as one of the martyrs. I'm telling you, people are not paying spiritual prizes to operate spiritual dimensions. They are just talking. You think what you are saying here is a joke? These things are real, but there are foundations. Make sure you are always filled with the Spirit. Be filled, be filled, be filled with the Spirit. That's one of the emphasis of the apostles. They were filled. They didn't do things out of the staring of the flesh. They did things out of the move of the Spirit. They were filled. They were filled. Keep yourself filled in the Spirit. Otherwise, you will have momentary euphorias. After two weeks, you are excited. After three months, you go down. You go to another meeting. You get stirred up. You are not supposed to live like that. See, pattern your life after the principles that get you stirred up. Let it be the pathway for your navigation. And you will see that all the stories you heard, you too will replicate them. Because if you are filled with the Holy Ghost, what the Holy Ghost did through one, He can do through you as well. Are you following? Be filled with power. The power is already there, but it takes tearings of the spirit to walk in it. It takes tearing. Stay tearing. Stay charged. Stay filled. Don't allow anything to deplete you. Some people are so dry that they can feel it. Yet they keep going on in life. What risk is that? You are dry. You know you are dry and you are moving out. After you have declared the name of Jesus publicly, you don't know that devils are interested in your destruction. How can you go out when you are dry? Don't try it. The moment the apostles knew they were dry, the Bible said they ran back to their company. It's a risk to move around empty and dry. When you are empty, go back to recharge because you are useless. All the potentials are intact, but they can't work. It's like your phone. The phone still has the capacity to stop the net. It still has the capacity to make calls. It still has the capacity to flash light. It still has the capacity to do everything it always has. But there is no charge. And because there is no charge, the phone has become a piece of metal. That's the problem with many Christians. They have the anointing. They have the power of God. They have the wisdom of God. But they are not charged. So they become like a piece of meat that the devil can pounce upon. Any day, any time, keep yourself charged. Every man sent, don't joke with power. And one of the triggers of power is the continual infilling of the Holy Spirit. They return to their company. They return to their company. When you are charged, anything is possible. The second trigger for power is the gospel. When you know the gospel, and preach the gospel is like firing a loaded gun. This is why when you study the Acts of the Apostles, they were always preaching. Because they knew preaching is a trigger of the power of the gospel. Paul was speaking in Romans 1.16. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He said, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believed. The gospel is the power of God. But there is a way to trigger that power. And all of the apostles knew. This is why they didn't just understand the gospel. They preached the gospel. Because the power of the gospel is released when it is preached. If you don't preach the gospel, the power will be bottled up. The moment you begin to preach the gospel, power is released. Let me show you. Everywhere in the Bible where the gospel was preached, there was a testimony of the supernatural everywhere. If you read it, either it is there immediately or it is there in context. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. The Bible said Jesus went everywhere. Even Jesus. Even Jesus. I'm showing you. See, these things we do is not magic. You know, people don't know these things anymore. So, the few people who are manifesting God, they gang up and say they are fake. How can you be fake if you are filled with the Holy Ghost? If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, even if you don't do anything, the Holy Ghost will overflow you. 
The Bible said they touched Jesus. Virtue left him and healed them all. Mark 6.19 or Luke 6.19. When you are filled, the team flows out of you. So the question you should be asking is, is this still possible to be filled with the Holy Ghost? If it is still possible to be filled with the Holy Ghost, then the question of being fake does not exist. The only time you can say everybody walking in power is fake is when it becomes impossible to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because if you are filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will overflow you. And the outcome is power. The question is, are people still preaching the gospel? If they are preaching the gospel, there must be power. Because the preaching of the gospel produces power. So the only time you can say what is happening is fake is when what is being preached is not the gospel. If what is being preached is the gospel, power is inevitable. Matthew 4, verse 23. See what the Bible said. And Jesus, the Bible said, went to every city and every village preaching the gospel. It said he went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogue and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases amongst the people. Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. He went to all villages and all cities. What was he doing? Preaching the gospel and healing every sickness and every disease. Why? The gospel is the power of God. The moment the gospel is preached, power is released. So it's either you are filled with power or you produce power through preaching. And this is why most of you who went out on soul winning, you were shocked the miracles you were seeing. Not because you were overflooded with the Holy Ghost, but because you were preaching the message. The moment you start preaching the message, it's the responsibility of the Holy Ghost to validate it. And one of the ways the Holy Ghost validates the gospel is by signs and wonders. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 20. Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Verse 20, he said, And they went. And he said, The Lord walking with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders. The trigger for miracles is to preach the gospel. Anybody can walk in miracles. And I'm talking about any dimension of miracles. Your job is to know the gospel and to preach it. The moment you preach the gospel, the responsibility for miracles and signs and wonders becomes the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 4. Hear what the Bible said. I'm telling you this so that you will live here with confidence. Because every one of us doing what we are doing, this is our secret. If you are looking for any special secret anywhere, there is none. Many times I go to preach, I feel empty. The moment I know I'm empty and I don't have time to refill, I look for the gospel. Because I know if I preach the gospel, the Holy Ghost enters his responsibility of confirming it. He said, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. You, these things can escape you. They can sleep from you. That's why you need to meditate on it and teach it consistently. Because you can lose it. Verse 2. He said, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it. He said the gospel of salvation was first of all what? Preached by the Lord and then confirmed to us by those who heard it. Now, see what the Holy Ghost did in verse 4. See the way the Holy Ghost confirms the gospel. He said, And God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Everywhere you see powerlessness, the first sign is that the gospel is not preached. Anybody who preaches the gospel will see the power of God. So I can tell you the reason there is so much powerlessness in Africa is because 90% of what we are preaching is not the gospel. I'm not saying there are no preachers. I'm not saying we are not talking. But we are preaching African religion. All our messages is on fatherhood, on honor, on sacrifice, on reverence, on everything that makes us relevant. And that's why our messages must be sophisticated to make us feel important. 
But the apostles were not validated by the sophistication of their message. They preached the gospel in its simplicity. And the moment they were done, the Holy Ghost shows up. And it goes on display. Because when the gospel is preached, the Holy Spirit goes to work. The Holy Ghost will only work if the gospel is preached. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. This is the secret of the apostles. Every one of them was a preacher of the gospel. And as they preached it, signs and wonders was normal amongst them. Philip was a deacon. He wasn't even ordained an apostle. And he was not the type of deacon we have now. They were ordained to be ushers of food. And the Bible said, Acts chapter 8, Philip went down to Samaria, verse 5. He said he preached Christ there. And he said the whole city. If one man takes a city today, do you know how we will explain it? That this man has stature. He has territorial and apostolic authority over territories. Philip was not a statured apostle. The only weapon Philip went with was the message of Christ. He said he preached Christ there. The whole city was full of joy. And what happened? Go to verse 6. He said, and there was great joy in the city. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. Hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. What were the miracles? It's not headache. It's not, I had back pain. I'm okay. See the miracles. It's the unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed. These are madmen. Philip was cleansing madmen, not with a special anointing, but with the simple message of the gospel. I'm not saying there are no special anointings. I'm not saying there are no men who have stature, but I'm giving you the foundational rudiment of power for everyone who is sent. Madmen were cleansed. And he said, and many taken with palsies. These are crippled and lame men. The wheelchair ministry. That is the most universally accepted ministry. Many who were maimed and carried with palsy and were lame. The Bible said they were healed. What was the secret of Philip? He preached Christ. He preached Christ. Listen, you are not going out with a feeling. We are not giving you feelings from this auditorium. As we impart you and give you the message of the gospel, you will go out with that message. You will preach it. Some will be excited. Some will not be excited. Their feelings don't matter. When you preach, step aside and leave the Holy Spirit and see what the Holy Ghost will begin to do. You know when miracles happen, even you, your mouth will drop open. What did I do? You did nothing. You only preached Christ. And the moment you preach Christ, the Holy Ghost went to war. This is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1. He said, when I came to you, although I am an orator, he said, I did not come to you with excellency of speech, declaring unto you the testimonies of God. He said, I choose to know nothing among you, save Christ and Him crucified. He said, my preaching and my teaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Preaching and teaching of what? Christ crucified. And he said, that preaching became the demonstration of the spirit and power. Listen, you will need power as you go out. But the secret for power is to know the gospel and to preach it. When you go anywhere and you feel helpless, preach the gospel. When you go anywhere and you are rejected, preach the gospel. When you go anywhere and the territory is difficult, preach the gospel. When you go anywhere and you see impossibility, preach the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's why I took time last week to show you the gospel. And I show you, showed you one of the methods of the gospel is what? Christ declared to be the son of God by power and the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. When you go to a place and you feel handicapped, Tell them, I came to preach to you about Jesus Christ. And begin by telling them that Jesus is the Son of God. And tell them that they were in their sins. And Jesus died for their sins. Jesus was buried. But on the third day, he rose again from the dead. That anyone who believes in him will be saved. And tell them, if they will believe now, they will see the power of God. You may not feel anything. They may not feel anything. But you declare that. Wait and see what the Holy Ghost will do. Wait. I learned this thing the hard way. I preach and I go to places where people clap hands for me for my intelligence. And unfortunately, the ministry began to grow. 
and I started going to places where my intelligence didn't mean anything to the people. I started going to places where my oratory didn't mean anything to the people. That was when I had to humble myself to preach the simplicity of the gospel. I told you how I went to Pakistan. When I was preaching, people were sleeping. And I could not dare just walk away from there. They had spent thousands of dollars mobilizing buses, over 40 buses, bringing the sick from different villages. You don't dare go there and say, give your heart to Christ and turn back. They will stone you to death. Do you know the pains we endured to come here? The deaf were there. The blind were there. The crippled were there. They were waiting to see the power of God. When I knew that my intelligence could not work, my mysteries could not work, I came back to the cross. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ and Him crucified. He said to the Greek is foolishness, to the Jews is a stumbling block. He said, but to us who have been saved, Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. Our generation has been taught emotion. And so we think power is feeling. Are you not tired? You have felt something for five years, nothing happened. You have sweated, nothing happened. Does it not suggest to you that something is wrong with what you are doing? There's nothing wrong with having feelings. Sometimes you can have feelings, but feelings are not reliable. What we are doing is not to generate feeling. What we are doing is to generate power. And the way to generate power is to preach a message that the Holy Ghost will validate. And that message is the gospel. Everyone who is a sent man must know the gospel and preach it. I am giving this to you as a sermon and I'm also giving to you as a counsel. There are many places you will go to. All you will need is the validation of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Ghost does not validate men. It validates the world. And so if you don't preach the gospel, you will never see the validation of the Holy Spirit. He said they went and preached the word. Every sent man needs power. And the first key to power is to be filled with the Holy Ghost. The second key to power is to preach the gospel. The third key to power is to have faith in the name of Jesus Christ. The apostles believed in the name of Jesus like it was their life. Peter was preaching in Acts 4.12. He said, there is no name under heaven by which men must be saved. There is no name except the name of Jesus Christ. And so everywhere they went, they exalted that name. But see the problem with us. We think the name of Jesus is part of a religious cliche. So when somebody is in danger, Jesus, 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 you have to delete that thing from your mind. Sit down and ask yourself, why is this name so powerful? Understand why that name is powerful and build your faith on that name. In Acts chapter 3 verse 6, they were going to the place of prayer. They had not prayed. If they had prayed, you say they are charged. They had not prayed. And they saw a man who was lame at the beautiful gate. The Bible said he was lame from birth. And they brought him there every day to beg for arms. And the man looked at them and said, please give me something. And he said the man was looking at them hoping to receive something. Peter said, look on us. He said, silver and gold have I known? He says, such as I have, I give you. What does he have? Or what did he have? In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. See, if you have not invested enough thoughts, enough study, on the name of Jesus to a point where when you are stranded, you can say Jesus and it's enough, you are not ready to be sent. Because one of the surest bailouts in life is faith in the name of Jesus. And I tell you quickly, why is the name of Jesus so powerful? Two reasons. The first reason is because of what that name contains. I shared it with them in Ghana two days ago. You know, when you are dealing with God, and please don't, don't worry, I'm keeping the service calm because we're already sweating enough. <laughs> There's already too much energy here to generate any extra one. Glory to God. The Bible said that in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. What does that scripture suggest to you? God does not need introduction. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He just began to tell you about his exploit. Why? 
If he created us, then all of us intuitively know that he exists. So you don't need to introduce God to anybody. Why then are names given to God? The reason names are given to God is because the way to trap divine dimensions is by names. So every time God met a man, gives him an encounter, in order for that encounter to remain with him, a name will be allocated to that encounter. So that every time he mentioned that name, the resources of that encounter manifest again. So when he wanted to send Moses to Egypt, he manifested as Jehovah, Yahweh. I am that I am. What does that mean? I am the author of all things and I have authority and rulership over all things. That means anything you need, anything you need me to be in any situation, I am that thing. That is the absolute power of God to judge and to deliver. But how we must carry this dimension to Egypt is that when you go to Egypt, say, I am have sent you. So every time you say, I am, you are not introducing him. You are invoking that dimension. And we saw that that pattern was consistent in the Bible. When Abraham went in Genesis 22 to sacrifice his son and God provided the lamb, Abraham didn't live there. I have met one who provides, but I don't need him to provide only now. I need him to provide every day of my life. So what did Abraham do? He tied that encounter to a name and he called it Jehovah Jireh. That means every time I call Jireh, provision becomes normal. So the names of God are capsules that host dimensions of God. And so in the Bible, you see that every time God manifests himself, a name is attached to it. So the way they carried God was through the many names that they carried. So you have Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shammah, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Roi, all kinds of names. All of that represented something. Every time they needed the God of fire to show up, they provoked Jehovah Ra. Every time they needed the God of hosts to show up, they provoked Jehovah Sabaoth. Every time they needed the God that provides to show up, they provoked Jehovah Jireh. So names for them were not nomenclatures. They were keys to dimensions. They were activators of dimensions. And so the names of God are the custodians of the dimensions of God. So the reason God has a name is so that anywhere, anytime, God can become anything you need him to be by just activating that name. Names are like keys in the spirit. You open it into dimensions of God. But you see, it becomes difficult to carry all of those names. So God wanted to make life easy for the new covenant. And so what did God do? The Bible said he pleased the Father that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in Jesus bodily. And so when Jesus was named, the totality of the dimensions of God was aggregated. So even before he was born, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 and 23, the angel came and said, his name shall be called Jesus because he shall save his people. And so all of the dimensions of salvation that they gathered together with many names in the Old Testament was reduced to one master key. And so any dimension of salvation you need, say Jesus. When you say Jesus, you have called Jaira. When you say Jesus, you have called Shaddai. When you say Jesus, you have called Nisi. When you say Jesus, you have called Roi. When you say Jesus, you have called Shama. When you say Jesus, you have called Sabot. When you say Jesus, you have called Ra. When you say Jesus, you have God El Elyon because the totality of God now has one envelope and that envelope is the man Jesus Christ and the way to activate the totality is to give you a name that summons salvation. So why is that name powerful? It is powerful because therein is the aggregation of the totality of God. So when I say Jesus, I don't need any lecture. Jesus can become end of poverty. Jesus can become end of sickness. Jesus can become deliverance. Jesus can become lifting. Jesus can become peace. Because everything God is, is now encapsulated into that name. This is why everyone who is sent must build faith. Absolute faith in that name. Don't go out and say, oh, I encounter Jesus, commission me. That's the name. But that name is not as strong as Jesus. Anywhere you go, tell them Jesus sent us. That's why the Bible said, Whatsoever you do, it said, Do in the name of the Lord Christ. 
That's where the fullness of God is locked into. Why is the name powerful? Number two, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 and 11. It is the instrument of judgment and dominion. When Jesus passed the test of divine justice, the Bible said, Therefore, God gave him a name that was highly exalted. It said, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is the Lord, both in this world and in the world that is to come. Anybody who wants to see power must have faith in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is not a cliche that Christians call. When we say Jesus, we are conscious that the totality of God is being activated. When we say Jesus, we are conscious that the power to dominate evil is being activated. This is the understanding that sponsors faith in the name of Jesus. But I can tell you, why is our generation helpless? Why is our generation powerless? Because we have built our confidence in rituals. We have built our confidence in feelings and emotions. And you know the deception of feelings and rituals? You will think the more you do them, or the more you have them, the more you have what you are looking for. But at the end of the day, the benefit of feeling is feeling. The benefit of ritual is satisfaction of the mag magnitude of what you have built. But if it's power you are looking for, brothers and sisters, trust that name called Jesus. I know many prayer warriors who don't believe in the name of Jesus. I know many people who quote a thousand scriptures who don't believe in the name of Jesus. I know many people who fast like fasting machines. They don't believe in the name of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, I've been here for a while. I know how powerless they are. I've seen many powerless. And when we see that there's no power to prove what we are claiming, then we begin to create manipulations, exaggerations, and all kinds of monuments that produce no result. That's why you hear all kinds of funny state talk talks in our generation. Go and raise an altar. And you'll see somebody come, lie down with money on the altar for five hours. All of those things are weak practices of the Old Testament. If people believe in it, I don't stop them. I know they are still growing. But see, when you grow up, you stop all of those jokes. You carry the name of Jesus. You preach the gospel. You are full of the Holy Spirit. And you will be shocked. The kind of notable dimensions that God will manifest through your life. Hear me, sir. Anybody can represent God to a generation. Anybody can manifest God to a generation. But you need to understand what works. And you need to pattern your life after it. If I tell you here now that God can open deaf ears, everybody will shout and say yes. If I tell you now God can open blind eyes, everybody will shout and say yes. If I tell you now that God can raise cripples, everybody will shout and say yes. If I even call the cripples out, call the deaf out, you will see people start clapping. God will prove himself today. That's not a problem. When they now come out and I say you come, pray for them. You will see that the excitement will diffuse. You know why? The reason they were shouting is because they thought I'm a special man. And so God can use me to do it. The moment I tell them to do it, they now evaluate themselves and say, no, they don't have what it takes to do it. You know why? The confidence is in the flesh. The confidence is not on the gospel. The confidence is not on the name of Jesus. The confidence is not on the power of the Holy Ghost. And we may not know it because we have not consciously thought about it. But this is our frustration in life. Every one of us should manifest God. But what do we know? And what do we trust Him? Tonight, God will do wonders in our midst. Tonight, God will do special things in our midst. But it's not because I am here. It's not because we are in an auditorium. It's because you have heard the gospel. That Jesus is the son of God. He paid the price for all your sins and your defeat. And if you believe in him, he will show himself strong. And the Holy Ghost will validate that message. And as you use the name of Jesus, heaven will back it up. Because the fullness of God is domiciled in that name. Are you ready tonight to receive something?
you many times. But trust me, very few have them. I believe in special anointings. I've taught it many times. But hear me, very few have them. The Bible said God did special miracles by the hand of Paul. Acts 19, 11 and 12. He said handkerchiefs and aprons were taken from him. They cast out devils and did miracles. I believe those things. I believe in special callings and special ordinations. No man taketh this honor upon himself. Even as it was upon Aaron. I believe those things. But we are teaching what anybody and everybody can apply. If you don't know these basics, you will never manifest the special ones. This is the problem of many Christians. Are you ready tonight? I want all the graduates to come forward. This is your time. And those online, they can connect now. to see you that I might impart unto you spiritual gifts that in the end you would be established the purpose of the impartation tonight is for you to be established in the things of God as you leave this place some of you begin to manifest 
dimensions of giftings of the Spirit. From miracles to words of knowledge, all forms of signs and wonders. But particularly God is telling me that for those of you graduating this, in this cohort, He said it's opening doors of nations. No wonder over 48 nations are graduating tonight. He said it's opening you up to nations. That means none of you is carrying a small ordination. The least you will be is a nation. Lift your hands toward heaven. This is the moment. I'll try to be very calm because of our environment. Those of you online, this is your hour. Stretch your hand towards the screen. It's time to receive. Father, such as I have, I give to them the gifts of the Spirit from workings of miracles to healing to signs and wonders, works of knowledge, all of the graces that we enjoy here, the grace for favor, the grace for influence, the grace for speed, the grace to bear the mandates of revival, the grace to speak over nations. In the name of Jesus, every one of you standing before me, I release that grace upon you. From the crown of your head to the source of your feet, Carry that fire now. Everyone connected online, in the name of Jesus, such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, receive that grace now. Receive that grace now. Receive that grace now. Let the fire fall upon you now. Holy Ghost! speak over nations, over territories, men that will walk wonders in their lifetime, speed, influence, by the Spirit, step into a new level, step into a new level, step into a new level, step into a new level,
their hands up to heaven. Let's be calm as much as we can. Do you believe the gospel? Did you receive the gospel? Do you believe the gospel? One that's a byproduct of the gospel. That's what God uses to confirm the gospel. Do you believe the name of Jesus? The name of Jesus produces wonders. Now with your hands lifted, in the simplicity of the gospel, the power of Jesus, I decree and declare, every bodily affliction you have now, I command it to break off your body. Some of you came here with ear conditions. Some of you came here with eye conditions. Some of you can't even walk. Some of you have organ infections. Now, in the name of Jesus that is above every other name, I decree and declare from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, be healed now. I command ear conditions to be healed completely. I command eye conditions to be healed completely. I command organ infections to be healed completely. I command bone and muscle conditions to be healed completely. I command blood conditions to be healed completely. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now I speak over your circumstances. Every negative circumstance, helper, orchestrated by demons, I rise up against it now. I command those demons, be gone now in the name of Jesus. And I command those circumstances to turn around now for your good. I command those circumstances to turn around now for your good. In the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Whatever crisis you are in right now, I bring you out in the name of Jesus. Whatever condition that you are in right now, I bring you out in the name of Jesus. I decree, be made whole in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Most of you stood in the hall. Most of you waited. Even though the condition was very hostile, you have demonstrated your love for Jesus Christ. Now I decree, because of that act of faith and sacrifice, everything you desire in righteousness, I decree and declare, in the next 24 hours, it is routed into your life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now lift your hand and just honor him. Lift your hands and honor him. Lift your hands and honor him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, precious Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you. Now check your bodies. Check your ear, check your eyes, check your body. If you have noticed a change, I know there are changes. If you have noticed a healing, check your body, check your body, check your body. If you have noticed a healing, can you wave your right hand? Your right hand. I'm seeing hands already. You have noticed a healing. Wave it, wave it, wave it higher. Wave it higher, wave it higher. My God, my God, there are many hands. Wave it. Wave it. Wave it. Somebody give the Lord a shout. Now, those of you waving your hand, come to me here quickly. We are not going to take any testimony, obviously, because of time and the environment, but we, we just need to give God the glory. Yeah, people are waving online. Wow. Wow. You are healed just right. Right on the chat box. I'm healed from so 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 and so infirmity. I'm in this country. Just write it. Those of you waving your hand, come quickly, come. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. You are healed. My name is this. I'm chatting from the UK. I was healed of so and so. Write it. Write it. Come to the altar. Climb up. 
little, not the big one. the condition here. I'm seeing somebody with a locked knee. A locked knee. For some years now, you've not been able to walk or stretch that knee. It's been locked. As I speak now, that knee has been unlocked. A locked knee. Check your knee. Somebody with a locked knee has just been healed. I, I just want to operate based on the gospel and the name of Jesus. That's why I'm not I'm not operating by a gift or an anointing. To show you that everybody can do it. Take take one or two. Yes, that there is a miracle here. Talk sir. to me. She says she was slapped. She, she was, was slapped physically. Physically. So when? she began to feel on the first of this month. She was slapped on the first of this month. So it affected her ears. She, be, she began to feel pain in her ears. It affected your ear. And the, the right eye. And, and, the arm. and the eye. But after the declaration, she said the pain disappeared. Now she's no longer feeling the pain. The pain the is ear gone. And the eyes. And the eyes. Yes, sir. Made whole in the name of Jesus. Help her. Yes, one more. Apostle Sam. Yes, please. This auntie came into the meeting with pain from the upper uh, region. You had pain on your upper region? Yes. For how long? For a long time. What happened now? After the we're going now, the pain disappeared. Pain disappeared by the power of the Holy Ghost. Give the Lord a big hand. Yes, please. What happened to the brother? Talk to me. You had blurry vision on your eye from the nose. Now the pain is everything is gone. How about the blurry vision? Give the Lord a big hand. Now I don't want to keep you for too long. I've decided to make the service very simple. Sincerely, we will sort this out and it will not happen again. But lift your hands toward heaven. I want to make a declaration over someone. The Lord is telling me now that the current level you are, God will give you the strength of 100 people. He will give you the advantage of 100 men. Father, I decree and declare everyone listening to me now on ground and online receive the capacity of a 100 men. Receive the results of a 100 men. Receive the dimensions of a hundred men. Receive the wisdom of a hundred men. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We will document your testimonies and we'll take it in subsequent services. Now, listen to me. I know today people were invited from all over. Some of you are coming for the first time. The idea of the gospel is not primarily to heal the sick, it's to give you eternal life. If you are listening to me now and you know that if the world were to end this moment, you don't know where you are going to, it means you are at risk. But the cure is to receive Jesus Christ. Wherever you are standing, you are not sure of your eternity and you want to receive Jesus now, lift your right hand. Let me lead you to Jesus Christ now. It's a risk to walk out of this world without accepting Jesus. I'm still a hand there. Lift it higher. Don't be ashamed. He said, if you are not ashamed of me before men, I will not be ashamed of you before my father. Lift that hand. Lift it. I can see some hands. Lift it. Clap hands for Jesus. Every one of you lifting hands, come to the altar quickly. Come here quickly. Come quickly. I surrender
blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that he died for my sins. He was raised from the dead for my justification. I, therefore, confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just said this prayers, congratulations. You are now a member of the family of God. Kindly send us an email, prayer at EncounterJesusMinistriesInternational.org. You can also visit our website at www.EncounterJesusMinistriesInternational.org. God bless you.